week, we were talking about uh, the man that had the dropsy. Uh, the dropsy was really what it was. It was an illness that caused someone to swell up. And they would be so swollen that they wouldn't be able to do much. Uh, and so this man maybe wasn't, was, was similar to a lame person or a blind person in the fact that he didn't have maybe a lot of use in most people's eyes. And so we were talking about why it was this man happened to be there. Obviously, he wasn't a servant in this household because with that illness, the dropsy, he wouldn't be able to do much. My wife uh, said to me, she said, uh, Rich, I believe that, that the Pharisees invited this man on purpose to see what Jesus was going to do. That may be that we don't know for sure, but the point that we do know or what the Bible does tell us is that Jesus saw this man, saw his need, and healed him even though he knew that there were others there that may have a problem with what he was doing. Sounds a lot like our story last Sunday morning. Remember, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. He gets done teaching. He looks across the way, and he sees a woman that had an infirmity, and that infirmity caused her to be hunched over, and this infirmity plagued her for 18 years. And remember, Jesus healed her of that infirmity, and then the ruler of the synagogue who was very pious, very uh, uh, prideful, began to uh, uh, rebuke Jesus. And Jesus then answered him in the same way that he answered these Pharisees in verse number 5. So we see two stories here back to back. It may be that this happened on the very same Sabbath day that the last story we talked about happened on. Jesus may have left the synagogue, left healing that woman of the infirmity, and gone over to this Pharisee's home. And they may have set it up, as my wife said to me. That it may have been a setup. They were going to have this man there with the dropsy to see what Jesus would do. And Jesus, before he did anything, looked around at these lawyers and these Pharisees, these people who knew the Scripture. And remember, it's one thing to know the Scripture. It's another thing to live the Scripture. And he looked at them and he asked them, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Giving them an opportunity to go ahead and say something. But they didn't say a thing. So he heals the man of the dropsy, and then he looks around, and they're still not saying anything outwardly. And so he gives the illustration of uh, taking an ox uh, and helping an ox out of a pit or taking an, an ass, a donkey that has fallen into a pit and helping it out and trying to illustrate to them that if you had something that belonged to you and it was in need of help, if it was the Sabbath day, you would help it, trying to get them to understand that this man really was a child of God. This man was someone who needed help, and he, as the Son of God, was going to help him. Now, this is the setting for the parable that we read. Jesus tells one other parable, excuse me, gives uh, some words of advice before he tells the parable in verse number, starting in verse number 16, and he gives advice to these Pharisees, these lawyers. Remember, these are men who know the scriptures. They're men of high regard, and he begins to give them advice about being humble, telling them, hey, when you go to a wedding, take the lower seat. Don't take the higher seat. If you take the, the seat of prominence, then someone who may have greater prominence than you will come to the wedding, and you'll be asked to move out of that seat and move down to a lower seat. And then you'll be humbled. Whereas if you humble yourself and you take the lower seat, there's a good chance that the person who's having the wedding will come to you and say, hey, you know what? You're an honored guest of ours. Why don't you move up? Why don't you take a, a higher position or a higher seat? And so he began to give them illustrations, give them advice on why they should, uh, what they should do and why they should do it as far as humility. And then he, we get to verse number 15. One of the men that's uh, sitting there at this supper, he then cries out, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus goes on from verse 16 down to verse number 24 to give us a parable that probably most of us are familiar with. I would say everyone, but maybe, maybe there's someone in here that's not familiar with this parable. Remember, a parable is a story. It's figurative. The characters are not real people. Uh, there is a story that has been referred to as a parable uh, in times past by some people, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But we know that's not a parable. It's not a figurative story because Jesus purposely named Lazarus. In a figurative story, when Jesus used a parable or a figurative story, he didn't use names. 
He just used uh, people's positions, uh, such as we see here. Now, there are uh, four different, if this thing, is this thing plugged in for me back there? All right, there we go. There's four different characters. Four, uh, I'm having technical difficulties the last couple services. All right, four different characters in this story. There's the master or the person who prepared the supper. There's the servant. There's the excuse makers, who we'll talk about uh, here in just a minute, and then the actual guests, the ones who actually came to this, this uh, great supper. Now, I want to just go through and look at these real quickly, and I want to tell you who I believe was the key to this parable or what the key to this parable was. Uh, first off, we see the master in verse number 16. It says, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. We have the master, the person who has uh, prepared this great supper. And this person obviously is very important because this person was responsible for the supper being prepared, for the invitations being sent out. Uh, later on, when the invitations are rejected or excuses are given, we see in verse number 21, So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. This master what, sends out more invitations. The original uh, people who were invited decided to decline or gave excuses. And he sends out more invitations. This man is very important because really without him having this supper prepared, without him uh, inviting the, the first group of people and then the second group of people, we wouldn't have this parable, this figurative story that Jesus used. Second, when we look back to our list of, of the four groups that were there, we see the excuse makers. The excuse makers. Look at verse number uh, 18 with me, if you would. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. Now, we're not told if all three of these excuses were given by just three people, for sure, or if there were more people and they all used the same excuses. We're not told if they were in separate locations, if the servant went from house to house, or if the, the servant was simply out there in the village and made a proclamation, and these people in the crowd began to cry out. But we are told what their excuses are. And we are told here that with one consent, they all made excuse. Whether their excuse was, as we see the first person giving the excuse of having a piece of property that they've bought, uh, but now needing to go see it, whether that was their excuse or it was the excuse of the last individual, the last man who says, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. It really doesn't matter what the excuse was. They were all uh, giving an excuse why they couldn't come. Look at the, the three excuses real quickly. I mentioned the first, uh, the first one and the last one. Uh, I read Oliver B. Green a long time ago, a, a message he preached on this passage of Scripture, and he talked about each of these individuals. And he, Oliver B. Green actually grew up uh, in an agricultural area. Uh, his dad was a farmer. And Oliver B. Green said about the first guy who says, I have, in verse 18, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. He says this guy had to be, if, if this man is telling the truth, had to be one of the most simple people you could ever meet. Because here's a guy who says, hey, I've bought a piece of property, but I haven't seen it yet. That would be the guy you'd want to sell the Brooklyn Bridge to. That'd be the guy that you'd want to try to pull the wool over his eyes if this is really the type of person he was. I mean, who's ever heard of buying a piece of property but not seeing it? There may be millionaires or billionaires out there that buy land here, there, and wherever, and they don't care what it looks like because they're just trying to reinvest their money. But for the most part, well, the majority of people, if they're going to buy a piece of property, they're going to go look at it. They're going to want to make sure, especially if they're going to grow crops there, that it's going to be able to produce crops. It's going to uh, be a fertile piece of property. They're not going to uh, just take someone's word on it. They might end up getting some uh, Louisiana Bayou property where they can't grow a whole lot on. And so Oliver B. Green mentions how this guy had to be a very simple person if, in fact, what he said was true, but it probably wasn't. 
because we know that he was giving an excuse. He was trying to come up with a reason why he could not make it to this supper. Verse number 19, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Now, Mr. Green said about this man that this man also would fit into that category of being simple, but maybe uh, uh, it, he'd be a little bit different. You might call him foolish because he says he's, got, he's already bought five yoke of oxen. Of course, a yoke would hold two. And so if he bought five yoke, that would be ten oxen. He had, he's bought ten oxen, and he says, I go to prove them. In other words, to make sure that they're in good physical shape. Now, I haven't bought a lot of animals in my life. Jose, I know you work with uh, cattle. I, I don't know how to prove a cow. I don't know how to prove an ox. I don't know how to go and test them. Uh, I would probably get taken advantage of if I was buying a horse because I wouldn't know what to look at. I know some people say, look at the teeth, I think, but I don't know what you would look at in the teeth. I'm that green behind the ears when it comes to, or wet behind the ears when it comes to uh, animals and how to buy them or prove them. But this man says, I've, I've went out on a limb and bought 10 of them, and I don't know if they can even handle the load that I need them for. I need them to pull things, uh, pull plows. I need them to be able to uh, last uh, a full day uh, out in the field. And I have not even proved them, but I've already bought them. He says, this man is foolish. He, uh, Oliver B. Green talked about how his father would never, never, never buy an animal without proving it first or testing it first to make sure this animal was exactly uh, what the, the owner said it was. And then we come to the last man, verse 20. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And Oliver B. Green, like so many preachers, joked, this is the only man with a good excuse. I have married a wife, and I cannot come. Of course, ladies, we're just kidding. Uh, but this man uses his, his marriage, uses his wife, unfortunately, once again, as an excuse. Now, is it possible this man had a domineering wife? It's possible. But it's not likely because, once again, we are told he made an excuse. All three of these men are given an invitation. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I've always thought to myself, why in the world would you reject this invitation? Uh, we're pretty sure that all three of these people that gave the, these excuses were men. And the way to a man's heart is through his what? His belly. Hey, they're invited to a supper, to a feast. And yet they do not want to go, which shows that their focus is on something else. Or maybe their disdain for the master was so great that they would turn down this feast. Looking back to our, our uh, cast of characters, I guess you could say, we see finally third, the actual guests who came to this feast. The Bible tells us in verse 21 that the master gave the command to the servant to go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Those who didn't have anything financially, those who had been injured physically and maybe lost a, a, a finger, maybe lost a limb of some sort, and so they were maimed. Those who were a halt, who could not walk well. Those who were blind, who could not see. Really, he said, go out and find the needy people. Go out and find the people that you probably wouldn't normally invite to my house. Go out and find those people. Because I guarantee you, those people are not going to turn down the invitation. They're going to accept it. They're going to accept it because of the feast, the food. They're going to accept it because of the honor that comes with going to the master's house. They're going to accept it. Go out and find them. We're told that the servant goes out and he comes back bringing those people that he finds that fit into this category, poor, maimed, halt, and blind. And he says to the master, there is still room. He says, there is, uh, yet there is room at the end of verse 22. And so what does the master tell him in verse 20, uh, 23? He says, go out. Go out again. This time go into the highways and the hedges and compel them. In other words, constrain them. In other words, get them to come. Do whatever you've got to do to get them to come. 
It doesn't matter if they're poor or rich. It doesn't matter if they're blind or they can see. It doesn't matter if they're halt or they can walk. It doesn't matter if they're maimed or they're whole. Get them to come. We need them here. I want my house to be full, he says at the end of verse number 23. These people came. The supper went on. And we look back to our four uh, people, our four groups of individuals, and the last person we see is the person that all of this, I believe, hinged on, the servant. There is one servant mentioned in this story. One individual in verse number 17, it says, and sent his servant at supper time. The master pre- prepares this feast. He wants to invite many. But he needs someone to go out and give out the invitations. That's the servant. The servant goes out. He gets excuse after excuse after excuse. He comes back and he says, Master, uh, none of them want to come. They all gave me excuses. The master then says, you know what? You need to go out and you need to find the poor and the maimed and the blind and the whole and bring them back. And the servant goes out and he brings them back and he says, uh, Master or Lord, it has been done and is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. And he says, go out again. Go out quickly. Compel them to come in. Go out to the highways and the hedges. I want my house full. And he goes out. And he does what the master tells him. What if the servant had said no? What if the servant had made an excuse? What if the servant had said, you know what? I would go out, but the three I've talked to already said they didn't want to come. And they gave me reasons that didn't hold water. Uh, I would go out again, but it's such a discouraging thing. Hey, we want to have this parable, this story this morning. With that in mind, it applies to us, obviously, because the master, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ or our Heavenly Father, who both send us as Christians out as servants, as their workers, to try to reach people for the cause of Christ. Do people give excuses as to why they won't come to church? Yeah. Do people give reasons why they won't get saved? Definitely. Is it discouraging? I'm not going to lie to you. It can be. But at the same time, can I tell you, there's nothing more exciting than seeing someone who's poor come into the family of God and become rich. There's nothing more exciting than seeing someone who was blind be made whole so they can see. Someone who was maimed and and they walked around missing an arm or or a leg and them being restored and, 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 and being healed. There's nothing more exciting. This morning as servants of God, we can either go ahead and obey the command of our master or we can make excuses. This morning, the work of the Lord all depends on you, and it depends on me. It hinges. It's the key. All of us know what hinges are, but you know what? We probably take them for granted. If we didn't have hinges, how would our doors operate? We wouldn't be able to close our doors at night and open them during the day and and let the the nice uh, wind and, 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 and sunshine in if we didn't have hinges. Hey, you are important to God today, not only because you're his son or his daughter as a Christian, but because you are his servant, and he needs you to do his work. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Father, I pray that you'd be with us this morning as we continue.